So it's Friday the 29th of March 2019. That, that, that date that it has been a near professional obligation for us all to trot out <laughs> every day of our working lives for the last two years. <laughs> and as we record it, just gone 7.30, we are, what, three and a half hours away from what was meant to be the big departure moment. And, well, it isn't. <laughs> That's probably the one thing we can say that again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we are. Not happening well, yet. <laughs> and instead, well... There's lots of questions and lots of attempts at answers and lots of uncertainty. And the good news, it means more Brexicas. And our favourite sound effect, Mr Claxon or Mrs Claxon. So it is Chris at Westminster. Laura at Westminster. Katia in Brussels. And a half-eaten custard tart next to Chris. Yes, thank you, Laura, and for that. And a half-eaten <laughs> custard tart. Actually, I won't sing anymore because um, I got one, Aww, one twist of response saying, it. what we know from Brexit cast is, and one of the points was, Katia can't sing. Aww. That's very That's, that's so that's harsh. That's so mean. Harsh. I don't I'm agree. I'm devastated. <laughs> devastated. This custard tart is the most nutritious thing I've eaten in about the last three weeks. Oh, see, I'm off again on custard tarts. Now, anyway, I've got a new... I have a new... Um, adjective for you today oh, right. when it comes to to europe yes because i've i've said so often that you know the eu is frustrated resentful irritated um it's they're weary today weary oh. weary 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 resignation reigns oh, oh yes dear. I think probably all quite weary. Yeah, well, b- because of the sort of what they perceive to be the sense of inevitability about what was going to happen today. It's just, it. well, it's partly today, but it's partly, as you were saying, you know, it's the 29th of March 2019. Mm-hmm. Mm. And, you know, EU leaders look back at this whole two years of negotiations allowed under EU law when a, when a member state wants to leave. Uh, all the drama all the really, really hard work that the negotiating teams have put in on the EU and the UK side, all the threats, all the cajoling, all the money and political time spent on it with summits and you know departments and EU governments and no deal planning. And what is there to show for it on March the 29th, 2019? Half, Half a custard tart. tart. <laughs> Half a custard tart and a partridge and a pear tree. Mm. Um, and, you know, and they just look today, I mean, the... The divisions in, in Parliament and government and Cabinet were just on screaming display in mm. glorious mm. technicolour, which is leading, and we'll come on to this obviously later in the podcast, but, you know, some EU leaders to think, really, do we want a longer extension of this? Mm. Is there any real prospect that the UK will unite around the Brexit question at any point? Should we, just before we dive into all of those myriad questions, just sort of recap on sure. where we are? Yeah, so we had the vote yeah. today and it was on the withdrawal agreement, but not the political declaration. Yeah, it was been a full vote, two and a half. Yes. <laughs> and, and it went down, but not by nearly as much down as the first two. 58 so, isn't that big a number compared with the other ones, it's even not, if it's still quite a big number. It's still a very heavy defeat. So mm. look, for the government, they were able to show today, uh, is this, this is the positive gloss, the government was sh- able to show today that they have made some progress mm. in banging heads together on their own side to get Brexiteers to realise, look, this is, in their view, as good as it's going to get for you, so get on board. Mm. And, you know, since the progress of, uh, of all of us over the many, 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 many months that we've been doing Brexit cast, the idea that Ian Duncan Smith, Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, all those kinds of people would trot through the lobbies and vote for the Prime Minister's deal, even half of Dominic it. Rob. Dominic Raab. Ra- yeah, Dominic Raab in the end. Mm. Blimey. Mm. Um, uh, you know, a few weeks ago that would have seemed, well, you know, not that likely. So they have shown progress. Mm. So number 10 have managed to get through another day and buy themselves a little bit more time. Question really here tonight is, is there any life left in that deal at all? Mm. Or is it just going to be subsumed into the sort of parliament parliamentary compromise thing that we'll see next week? Um And, uh, and <laughs> former minister and, and uh, very thoughtful MP texted me today and said, I need to build more brick wall in my office on which to bang my head. Mm. Um, but there was, a, you know, there is a feeling in government, it might be crazy to think this, and some people in government think, look, it's crazy, it's nuts to have even had another go like this. But, well, they managed to show some kind of progress, uh, 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 except, of course, 
it's not really in their hands anymore. No. But would, I, the, would the speaker allow them, uh, the government, to to bring the meaningful vote again? Well, well again, I know yeah. it wasn't officially a meaningful well, that, vote. So, so that there are. I mean, that's a very good question. But what I would say when it comes to parliament, parliament, there are always sort of cunning ways around. So I don't think they would. Uh, he would allow them to bring it in exactly the same form. But there's chat tonight that the government might put their deal as one of the options in the kind of runoff. Mm. You know, strictly come Brexit whatever you want to call it, Eurovision, when it gets to Parliament voting on the options it wants next week. And, you know, I think, and you might have checked the numbers, I think the PM's deal got more, more votes than today than any of the, the other day. options last yeah. week. Um, so, you know, if you're a positive minister trying to cling on mm. to something, you might cling on to that. Um, the second thing is, the other thing doing the rounds is they will try another go, but they'll fold the vote into the withdrawal and implementation bill. Yeah. And that will become MV3. Uh, but look, I mean, none of, none of this at all is is, well, taken, just, for, is, is taken for just, granted. Just before we dive into all of that, I was I spent yeah. quite a bit of time in the gallery. Yeah, what was it like? Because I was well, it was really extraordinary, and, and, and also then chatting to MPs privately who were scuttling in and out and all that kind of stuff. And you know, clearly outside, I mean, there were, there were campaigners from both sides of the argument outside. But for some, there's that kind of boiling anger that Parliament has faffed about and that the deal. You know, of delivering Brexit by today has failed. But what was striking in there, particularly amongst those who had a difficult decision to make, was that sense of anguish, that oh, sense yeah. of tor- uh, torment. So I was speaking to one MP who was a Conservative, is a Conservative, and uh, didn't back the government today. And this person said they'd been in tears, that they were rack. They were passionate, passionate supporter of Brexit, Mm -hmm. totally get the argument as articulated by someone like Dominic Raab, who's come to the conclusion that he fears that whilst he doesn't like the deal, Mm -hmm. Brexit might be lost entirely unless you back it, kind Mm -hmm. of gets that, understands the risk of that, but ultimately thinks that the deal is a greater risk for all of the arguments that we rehearse regularly around getting stuck in the backstop and all of that. Sure, and they really care. that human anguish, that human sense of anguish about what to do because neither option is easy. And let's have a listen to Richard Drax, actually, one of those firm Brexiteers who hates this deal, hates it, but uh, voted for it in the end, but sounded, you know, really torn up about it Mm. just after the vote. Only one thing the Prime Minister can do, get us out on the 12th of April, get our country back and deliver what we promised. Because if we don't, God help us. Do you think that she should stay in her job? No. Oh, you could drive a double-decker yeah. bus through that gap, right. that pause. Absolutely, that and he a... just said that before. I feel ashamed of myself mm. that I voted for this thing, and then because, of course, if all of those people had fallen in behind it and it went through, <clears throat> blimey, goodness mm. me, what a turnaround that would have been. But the other thing that's been, you know, very notable today. I mean, it's not that unusual for Westminster now today, but there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I don't know what the official numbers would be uh, 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 of people in Parliament Square gathered absolutely furious that this mm. isn't happening on time. So, I mean, at one point I was sitting in a, an MP's office this afternoon talking to them about what was going to happen next. They were like, what? They said, I don't know what's going to happen next. Let's phone the chief whip and find out. And I thought, well, great, if you can phone the chief whip and ask him and then tell me, that would be fab. <laughs> but we could hear Tommy Robinson shouting out how his window. Mm. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, it's been a very, uh, a very, very fraught day for a lot of people. I, know, I, was, I, I was on Five Live just after the result in Central Lobby and it was one of those great moments journalistically where everyone, everyone's coming out and normally out, you, yeah. go, you go through all these hoops, don't you, to yeah. get interviews and can you come and yeah. see me at this time and that. They're all yeah. piling out, they're queuing up to come on the radio. Sure. It, was, it was a delight. Yeah. And obviously there was the full sort of spectrum of opinion around the deal and what should happen and all the rest of it. But the one thing that MPs across the piece got was that perception of that giant gulf between mm-hmm. the people and Parliament. Sure. And... And of course, it's complicated, isn't it? Because there were mm. people who were former Remainers who backed the deal and yeah. didn't, mm-hmm. and Leavers who backed the deal and didn't. Mm-hmm. So people's motivations for voting in different ways can be incredibly really, really broad. Mixed, yeah. But the collective outcome of it all is is one where, if you're outside looking in, you can very easily conclude that 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 the that Parliament's let you down, that the government's sure. let you down, and, that, that it's not working. And right behind the Speaker's chair, so when we're right in the bowels and the corridors of power, so in the kind of green baize corridors almost they are like, aren't they? If you've never, you know, amazing privilege to be able to go and bustle around in there. Mm. And I was right in behind the Speaker's chair, which is right the kind of way that MPs go in and out of the chamber. And I saw a Cabinet Minister literally with his finger jabbing in one of his colleagues' face saying, this place is going to stop it. 
We're not going to leave on the 12th. This place is going to stop it if you don't vote for it. That's your choice. Mm. Mm. And then they both like walked off at speed. I mean, it's real anguish and real passion alive because a lot of the people in government, Brexiteers in government, feel a lot the, sa- the same way, Chris, mm. as, as, as mm. you've just been mentioning. They feel actually this place, Parliament, is stuffed full of Remainers. And, you know, that is, of course, overdone. But it is absolutely the case that there are lots and lots of people in Parliament who hate the idea. Mm. And uh, there was brilliant eye-rolling from Tory MPs when I watched Dominic Grieve, who, of course, is a massive advocate of another referendum. And we know what his very legitimate views on the whole thing are absolutely entitled to hold those views. But he stood up in Parliament this afternoon and made a speech about compromise. And I was in the chamber at that brief moment as well. And you should, I mean, eye-rolling, I think, is a very polite way of describing how some of his colleagues were looking to him. Mm. Because for the Prime Minister's view, this is a compromise. It's a compromise Mm. inside the Tory party. It's a compromise between the EU and the UK. It's a compromise between Leave and Remain because it's a kind of moderately Eurosceptic deal. Mm. Um, So for the kind of ultras, whether they're ultra Remainers or ultra be Brexiteers, to be talking about compromise, there are people trying to make this whole thing work. You know, bang the table. And did the DUP take everyone by surprise today? Mm, no, really. about rather remaining than wasn't there that? Oh, oh yeah. Well, Nigel Dodds told Nick Watt, our colleague from from uh, Newsnight, that basically if the deal stays as it is, he'd rather stay in the EU. Yeah, and it's that and interesting think, thing, isn't it, of the yeah. last couple of days, where where you've seen this this kind of division between at least some in the in the ERG, the mm. European Research Group of Conservative MPs, and the DUP as to what their absolute bottom line is. Right. And for the DUP, they're passionate you. advocates of Brexit, but there's a there's a higher there's a higher thing to aspire to, which mm-hmm. is that maintenance of the of the union of mm-hmm. Northern Ireland and, and Great Britain, uh, versus for some within the ERG that Brexit is is the absolute bottom sure. line and their vision of Brexit. Sure, but I wouldn't go too far on assuming that this kind of split, that divorce in that slightly strange marriage between the DUP and the ERG is 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 permanent. Because mm-hmm. I sort of tried out that theory on on one of my contacts who's you know involved in all of this kind of stuff, and they said to me, "Yeah, they're getting behind her today so they can stab her in the back." <laughs> Right, because nice. there are people who voted for it today who who may well not vote for the bill if it comes Quite. through. I mean, let you Quite. know. Let, yep. Goodness me, we're going to have months to talk about all of this, so let's not jump way ahead to that because there's so much in today's vote. But I do actually think it's one of those moments for many of the public and probably lots of Brexit casters too. And the big picture was they were told we're going to leave at this date, and Parliament hasn't delivered that, and the mm. government hasn't delivered that, and that's a big like what? Yeah, and 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 everything else is noised. But to yeah, to to an extent. So let's get on to extension because I, I think that the, the, the big yeah. implication of this, right, is that the government's going to have to ask for an extension. Yeah. Of course, the EU might say no, mm-hmm. but it will be up to them. So, Katia, what do you think the chances are? Because a lot of people here assume they'll say yes, but there are people mm. in government who are very worried about Monsieur Macron. Mm, they're right to be. It's really interesting because I think up until quite recently, like pretty much today, uh, the assumption was the EU will say yes because the EU wants to avoid a no-deal Brexit. The EU does still want to avoid a no-deal Brexit. However, there are a number of countries, and France is first and foremost there, questioning the point of a longer extension. When they look at all the divisions in the UK, they wonder, as I said right at the beginning, whether there will ever be an answer to the Brexit question or whether a long delay would just end up in a no-deal Brexit anyway. And, and if that's the case, mm-hmm. they're saying, well, why not just do it now? Because for Emmanuel Macron, that would be far preferable. Right? And he's the one in government, the cabinet ministers say, that's what they were saying this morning, late last night. We've got to have another go at getting this vote today because we worry about Macron. And unusually, mm. I had a call from someone I've got to know on the EU side quite late last night saying, what are they doing? Don't they understand that Macron might say no? And I thought that I, I was think fascinating. It is. I, I think, though, and as we know, that when the UK asks for an extension or another extension in this case, the answer has to be unanimous. So there would be no good 26 EU leaders saying yay and Emmanuel Macron saying nay. But what I'm not saying here is that he will say no. What is pretty much for sure, if things carry on, and of course, as we know, one day is like a Bible in Brexit (laughs) making, whatever. But um, if we get to the 10th of April and the Prime Minister asks for a longer extension, the moment she leaves the room, boom, there will be a massive, loud, feisty debate 
I, I would imagine that the debate that EU leaders had about granting the short extension at the last summit, which took hours, remember, will, it'll be much feistier this time round because there is such strong feeling about this. For Emmanuel Macron, for example, as well, don't forget he's Mr. Europe. I mean, he hasn't had a great success so far, but if you look at where he is in the polls domestically, he at least wants to make a success uh, on the European stage. And having us, I mean, I know I've said this before, but having us sort of dragging along as an ongoing EU member when we already have 8.5 toes out of the door, <laughs> when there are so many big EU decisions to make in the near future, the European parliamentary elections, okay, but then, then you know, they have to choose a new president of the European Commission, a new president of the European Council mm. and decide the next EU budget. Macron's nightmare is that the UK digs its heels in and tries to push for advantage in whatever... Um, and, and blocks big EU decisions. And that's why, you know, he's kind of thinking really seriously, we're better off out. And if, if earlier rather than later, and if he does go down that road, then you know how we've got at the moment, say the 22nd of May is like the last date, if you like, if, if, if EU leaders say, all right, you know, you're not really going anywhere. So we'll give you until the 22nd of May to deal with no deal planning, you know, and use it for themselves as well. It's thought that, you know, Macron again will not want that. Why not? Because European elections start on the 23rd. Would you want a messy no-deal Brexit the day before? No. So that's where you start looking even earlier that he might say 1st of May, for example, would have to be our outdate and just, just give us that window of time to do more no-deal planning and, this, and the same um, for the rest of the EU. So I would say we, we shouldn't take it for granted that the EU will just say, yeah, no worries, a longer extension. However... If the Prime Minister holds another meaningful vote and the numbers get smaller of, of those who reject it or you know, it passes, obviously that's an, a whole other scenario. Mm -hmm. If MPs manage to unite around another way forward like a customs union, a softer kind of Brexit then I think it would be difficult for EU leaders to say no. Well, I've got to thank the Elysee Palace, at least, for giving me the chance to eat the remainder of that uh, custard tart <laughs> during the duration of your, uh, your analysis there. You don't um, think I was wanging on again, <laughs> were you? No, no, no just, just reporting on the consumption <laughs> of my... Uh, the thing is, my, it's so complicated. Uh, creme creme anglais, my my they? creme anglaise, as they were I know yeah. you guys know they're this. Nice. Portuguese tarts, though, actually. Oh, are they? Sorry. Yeah, they're Stop making me jealous. I'm, I've got there. a pen and paper and an epoxy glass of water. I got but, you know, Chris, when you went back to those heady days of saying, what's going to happen? I don't know. Oh, yes. we're, we're kind of back there again. We are, because, yeah, and we that's, are. And that's why I'm wanging even more than normal. And it's not just because it's Friday and, you know, I've kind of hit my own brick wall. We are. But, it, but it's also just because it's so nuanced. And if, I, if we say, yes, France says this, then it's like, oh, France is going to say no. But it's not as good as that so it's at It's definitely all. maybe, though, isn't it? So the government's probably going to have to ask for an extension. <laughs> They're probably going to get it, but there might be pretty punitive conditions attached. And therefore, or it's not impossible right now to say that we won't leave without a deal on the 12th of March. Mm. I gotta, oh, I April! <laughs> April. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. But that's kind uh, of, I mean, that's all we can say tonight, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Parliament's going to try and force a softer Brexit on the government mm -hmm. next week. Theresa May's probably going to have to ask for an extension. Mm. What the EU says uh, might mean that we leave without a deal in a fortnight. Or that there's some sort of and extension. And if Parliament can't agree, or that some kind of extension, and the extension might be a bit grim. And if, none, if nobody can agree any of that, it is true. We might be heading to a general election. No deal is seen is not no longer sort of a hammer. It's something that's seen as very very realistic. Here is also making the EU deal with internal hot potatoes that they've totally avoided mm -hmm. up until now. One is um, just getting Spain to get a move on with uh, with the visa, with what could happen with visas, so the UK can travel, UK citizens can travel in the case of a no deal Brexit without a visa. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, most importantly, is Ireland pressure, internal pressure now on Dublin to do better no deal planning when it comes to the border. Merkel is heading off to Dublin next week and the EU is just absolutely insistent that their single market be protected in a no deal. So Dublin is coming under pressure. And to complete the Eurovision, let's end this evening's Brexit cast with a message from Greece. Ah, uh, yes. Σου όλα τα παιδιά από το Brexit cast. Λοιπόν, απόψε θα κάνουμε Βενγέρα. Let me tell you what a Βενγέρα is. So Βενγέρα is a word that they use on the island where my family comes from in Greece. The island's called Andros. And Βενγέρα is kind of what you guys do. You talk long into the night, mostly about politics, but also love and anything that gets people really, really riled up. When you have a Βενγέρα, 
you have to have it with copious amounts of something called siporo. Now, if you don't know what siporo is, I'm very happy to donate a few bottles for you to have in the studio to help you get through <laughs> the next days, weeks, <laughs> nights of all of this Brexit. Anyway, take care of yourselves. I love what you do. Nasta kala, pedia. So, Dino, how do you say thank you so much in Greek? Afaristo poli, poli, poli. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much. What a lovely way to end our 29th of March commemorative non-Brexit day, Vengera. Indeed. Goodbye. Bye-bye.